After the very first one of those massive marches, I was walking down um, the Finchley Road with my daughter and a convoy of cars with Palestinian flags with a megaphone was screaming out, rape Jewish women and rape their daughters. My daughter walks on that route for school every day and said was so upset and distressed and was saying, you know, my, you know, for days after, weeks after, you know, mummy, what does this mean? Am I going to be raped? That was done in the name of Palestinian activism. Welcome to Marshall Matters with me, Winston Marshall, where I look into the creative industries and what topics can and can't be talked about in this day and age. Today I feel very lucky to be joined by actress and writer Tracy Ann Oberman. Tracy Ann is a stalwart of British television and has performed in such classics as Doctor Who, EastEnders, The Tracy Ullman Show, Ricky Gervais' Afterlife, and one of my all-time favourites, Toast of London, as Mrs. Purchase. That is to name but a few, host of the Troll Podcast and, until recently, believe, I believe, a lifetime member of the Labour Party. Tracy Ann has become an activist on the issue of anti-Semitism in the party, but also within the film industry. Tracy Ann, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for having me, Winston. And you're, are you in London at the moment? I am. Yeah. I am in London, yeah. Uh, we haven't really travelled out. I haven't travelled out other than for work since um, since uh, lockdown, the first lockdown. Really? Which is difficult because we normally travel quite a lot. Yeah, because yeah. you, you were due to do a touring uh, show, is that right? Of, of uh, yeah, Merchant I, of Venice. I was, yeah. And we were meant to be taking that abroad as well at some point of the Merchant of Venice and also, um, you know, sort of filming abroad. I have been working, but it's all been in England. And we come a lot to LA uh, for for work, and um, that's been off the cards as oh, well. I'm so, so sorry. It must be very frustrating. W yeah, where did your passion for acting come from? You, you're born and raised in London, right? And and yeah, and I was born and raised in North London. Um, my family, uh, you know, were working class immigrants, uh, Jewish. You know, came in from the East End, um, and we moved out to uh, North London, the very far end of the Jubilee Line. And I, I think. Sh um, Shelley Winters always said, I always remember her saying this, that when you're born, a fairy goes over your crib and says, you shall be a doctor, you shall be a dentist, you shall be an accountant, you shall be a nurse. And she's always said, and if you're really, really unlucky, that fairy will say, you shall be an actress. <laughs> I do think that that was it was something that I was born um, knowing that I wanted to do. I think it is vocational. Um, but my family were, you know, saying you wanted to be an actor or anything creative was like saying you wanted to be an astronaut. It was, what are you talking about? You know, who's, who's an actor? How can you be an actress? Nobody does that. How do you make a living? What sort of what sort of background were they, professionally speaking? What kind of background, what were they? Um, a great grandparents who I was very close to uh, when I was brought up, they came more from the kind of, um, the, the schmutter business, you know, the sort of uh, that kind of working class stalls, bringing in fabrics, selling it. In fact, my great, my grandfather always said that they were the first people to bring in jeans into the to this country and they sold them on their market stall. But then I've subsequently gathered that everybody's Jewish grandfather said that they were the first people to sell <laughs> jeans. <laughs> Lee jeans, I think it was. Um, or oh, Levi. Uh, and my dad, you know, again, when you come from those sort of immigrant backgrounds, they, they work their asses off to give their kids an education. My dad then became a lawyer um, and always hated it and wanted to be a footballer. But uh, and and then I I was the anomaly and rather than go into a secure profession, became a, an actress. And I'm reclaiming that word, Winston. Actress. Yeah, because Dorothy Parker always said, scratch an actor and you get an actress. And I think that is true. We're all actresses. So um, your your family were in the fabric industry and uh, and but also right your your great grandmother uh, was on uh, uh, in the East End when Mosley's black shirts were um, uh, marching and she uh, stood uh, uh, up against them. Is that is that is that right? Am I getting the story That's right? That's true. That absolutely true. Uh, Ridley Road is a BBC One um, is a BBC One four part drama that I think is now out in America and is being bought globally and it. It tells the story of um, 1960, the 1960, the 62 group, which was a bunch of East End Jewish um, activists. And actually it went across the country uh, because Oswald Mosley, who had been an anti-Jewish um, fascist uh, leader, who could have been the leader of the Labour Party, 
um, marched on the East End, was very good friends with Hitler, uh, and in fact got married to his second wife, Diana Cooper, Diana Mitford, um, at Goebbels's house with Hitler as a witness. You know, the British, as much as they try and ignore their fascist past, have had a great flirtation with fascism, um, particularly amongst the aristocracy, actually, at times of, of great uh, chaos and, 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 and potential unease. So yes, I came from a family of my great grandmother stood uh, against with all the other working class communities of that East End um, Cable Street March, which was fighting the Jewish entity, uh, the Jewish, um, the Zionist uh, enemy, uh, Judah, Perish Judah, and Ridley Road under um, took that to the 1960s. And what this country has forgotten is that in 1962, there was an enormous rise of fascism under a man called Colin Jordan, who was an acolyte of Mosley. And he, um, so soon after the Holocaust with British troops that had liberated those camps, uh, where, you know, six million Jews had been gassed, murdered, mutilated, many of, some of whom were my family and many other people's families, um, he marched uh, across the country against against the, the Jewish entity again and Perish Judah. And um, in the East End of London, they were burning synagogues, they were attacking Jews. And the worrying thing in the 60s was there was very little help from the authorities. The police weren't that interested, um, MPs weren't that interested, and the very authorities that should have been protecting uh, this, this group actually didn't. And so the Jew, Jewish... Um, sort of working class community took it into their own hands to look after their own and they set up the 62 group and they were like a vigilante group that would had infiltrated um colin jordan's organization they would find out where the marches were happening they would find out when they were attacking the synagogues where they were burning the jewish you know jewish people i think one boy was killed and they would actively go out on the streets and fight violence with violence and what was so um interesting about this series is that this is a Jewish archetypal character that we don't really see. Tell me if I'm talking too much, Winston. Which, 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 which is the archetypal character? Well, you know, we're used to seeing, particularly in Britain, our archetypes of Jewish characters are Fagin um, from, you know, Oliver Twist uh, or is Shylock that, you know, my duck, it's my daughter. And also we uh, Holocaust victims or um, the American version, which is the nerdy Jewish man and the Jewish American princess. These are the archetypes of characters that we see. But here in Ridley Road was sexy, exciting, um, empowered, fighting working class Jews who weren't victims um, and who didn't and who didn't, um, you know, who stood up and, and, and empowered themselves. And it's not not Jewish characters we're used to seeing. Inglorious Bastards comes to mind as, as another version of that, um, uh, uh, the, the changing of the archetype. On One that. of my favourite films, yeah, absolutely. Inglorious Bastards totally did that. And, and it's so powerful because exactly that, we're not victims. We're more than just being seen in concentration camps and we're more than just being seen as doctors. I mean, it's, you know, this whole idea of Jew face as well and Jewish characters, Sarah Silverman's been talking about that. Is it Sarah Silverman or Sarah Silverman? Sarah Silverman has been talking about that a lot recently saying, you know, why is it that the Jewish character or the Jewish actress is either the pushy best friend, the neurotic mother, she never leads a, a narrative, she's not seen as a romantic lead. There's a lot of negative, and if, if, if there is such a Jewish character, she's invariably played by somebody who isn't Jewish. So um, I think that there's a lot of very interesting debate around Jew face at the moment as well, which has come out of, is it, if it's not right to black face and it's not right to yellow face, and you know, if trans actors are being played by um, anyone other than trans actors, why? I think the same respect and debate has to be put around Jewish characters too. Hmm. And so the, is the answer to that to write more or have more uh, sh uh, films and stories where those, those uh, old archetypes are pushed aside and new archetypes are written? What, or or what, what do you think's a way for, what, what do you want to see for, from your industry in, in, that, in that sense? Um, you know, it's funny, Winston, I'm, I'm, you know, I am a working, you know, and I'm, a, I'm an actress and I'm a writer, I'm a creative, and I, I've I found myself again and again at the forefront of this debate, being very vocal about it. Uh, and I found myself becoming more of a spokesman and it makes me, you know, it's interesting that that's the position that I found myself in, that so few people 
have talked about this in our industry. I think the answer is to when you're, I think we have to look for more interesting Jewish stories. I think we have to have um, more debate about who represents those stories, who are the writers, who are the producers, who has the right to appropriate that. Look, as an actor, we can, you know, as an actor, you can play anything. That's the whole thing about acting. And the industry, I think, is boxing itself in more and more in that maybe, you know, if you can only act what you are, then that does that become documentary and less about the art of acting. I think what David Baddiel so brilliantly said in his book, and I think it's something that he and I have felt for a very long time, is if every other minority in this period of time is being given the respect in the industry of cultural appropriation, who can play them, sensitivity, the same, and the stories that are being told, the same has to be done for Jewish characters and Jewish stories. So yes, we have to find more interesting stories, more varied stories, and more ways of challenging the anti-Jewish tropes and archetypes that we're used to seeing. On, on, on the sort of issue of, of, of being Jewish in the film industry, you said some, some uh, uh, quite striking things, um, which, which actually is one of the, um, in, in exploring the issues that we can and can't talk about. Um, I think you said, uh, uh, Jewish performers are feeling particularly unsafe at the moment. And I think you said that's in summer 2021. And, and is, I mean, is that, a separate issue. I think that that might have been in, in reaction to equity, the trade union uh, for actors and actresses, um, uh, uh, them in support of BDS, or if it wasn't BDS specifically, it was a line against Israel. It, 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 am I getting this right? Or um, it's a, look, this is a, it, you know, this is a really nuanced and difficult thing, in my opinion, and many other people's opinion. Equity is the actors' union. It has a very broad range of actors that it is meant to work with. In the time of um, incredible insecurity for actors, where theatres and films went down, where all of us are self-employed, where most actors were just worried about where the next you know meal check was coming in. It was not up to equity or their leaders to make a very strong stand on um, calling for sanctions against Israel. You know, uh, you can be as critical of Israel as you like. There is, it is a very complicated and nuanced geopolitical situation, but absolutely hold that government to account. However, what you don't have the right to do when you are running a union is to ignore every other issue but to become obsessed about one issue. So when the, the, um, the president and the general secretary of um, equity called for their members to go on a sanctioning Israel march, what they were sanctioning, uh, uh, what they were actually sanctioning themselves was to march with people who the week before and the week before had been holding up the most horrible anti-Semitic banners. They were seen stand, you know, these people were standing in, in support for Palestinian rights. And absolutely, we support that. But what you can't do is hide your Palestinian activism under anti-Semitism. So you can't ask for your people to go on a march next to people that were holding up banners of Hitler, um, of, 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 um, of Hitler uh, in a piece of saying Hitler was right. You can't ha ask your people to go on a march with a woman uh, politician who called for an intifada on the streets of London, um, which effectively is calling for death to Jews on the streets of London. You can't ask your membership to support and go on a march with a big picture of um, Jesus being nailed to a cross with, they did it to him, don't let them do it again. I mean, these are repulsive anti-Semitic tropes. And I have to tell you, Winston, after the very first one of those massive marches, I was walking down um, the Finchley Road with my daughter and a convoy of cars with Palestinian flags with a megaphone was screaming out, rape Jewish women and rape their daughters. My daughter walks on that route for school every day and said was so upset and distressed and was saying, you know, my, you know, for days after, weeks after, you know, mommy, what does this mean? Am I going to be raped? That was done in the name of Palestinian activism. And um, another example is recently around um, North London in Jewish areas, convoys driving through, Jews being attacked. There was a big, after that march, that 
equity had endorsed, a large group of men were wandering around the streets of Knightsbridge looking for Jews to kill, Zionists to attack. This is a march that equity were endorsing their members to go on. Equity have, have put out 24 statements about Israel. When I looked through their list, they'd done nothing on any other complicated geopolitical situation. Uyghurs, Myanmar, Rohingyas, nothing. So then one has to say, this is the obsession of certain people in the leadership. So it led me to realize that if they're prepared to endorse that, a lot of Jewish actors then spoke to me and said, you know, when I go into a rehearsal room and I've got my Mog and Dovid on show, the minute I go into a rehearsal room, I tuck it in, I don't want anybody to know I'm Jewish. Why don't you want anybody to know you're Jewish? Because I don't want to immediately have to get into a political purity test about Israel. I don't want to get asked, have you been to Israel? Are you a Zionist? What's your position on Israel? How do you feel about the Palestinians? Similarly, friends of mine who come from other cultures, Iranian, Chinese, um, you know, Muslim, they're never put in a position uh, of having to go through a political purity test. And so that's what I felt so strongly about. And then found myself on Newsnight and other programs flagging up the fact that behind the scenes, many, many people were calling equity out and saying how disgusting it was that they had endorsed this. But worse than that, but they weren't prepared to put their head above the parapet and say it. But worse than that, equity doubled down on it. They sort of went, you know, you can be a member here if you're a certain type of Jew with a certain type of politics uh, and we're not we're not overly apologetic to anyone who feels that they're sort of oppressed in a rehearsal room or in a work situation. Why won't they put their heads above the parapet? What, what, why? Because a lot of people are scared. I, when I first started, you know, we're, <laughs> we're going about this, but when I, when I first, you know, I, when, when Jeremy Corbyn was elected as the leader of the Labour Party, a lot of people thought that he was um, a positive and, uh, you know, change is coming was their motto. And the longer that Jeremy Corbyn was in power as the leader, more and more and more about him, his associations, his affiliations, uh, and um, his problem, in my opinion, with allowing anti-Semitism to flourish in the Labour Party without really coming down hard on it became more apparent. Now, this is up for debate, but when you have a leader who cannot see a problem in endorsing a mural that effectively looks like a Nazi propaganda mural with Jewish bankers pushing down on the heads of the workers and no thought to have that mural that had been painted on a wall in East London, I think, allowed to stay up. When you have got when you don't have a problem with a man who was present but not involved in a wreath laying um, exercise uh, for the Palestinian um, liberation with terrorists, who uh, you know what this is all very difficult because he's starting to sue. You know, in my opinion, oh, sorry, Winston, it's difficult. Don't don't be sorry. I started speaking out um, against the Labour Party when I could see lots of anti-Semitism casual anti-Semitism, misogyny, and effectively racism being allowed to pass under the banner of, uh, of Labour. So when I go to Glastonbury and I see posters, um, three massive posters talking about the Rothschild entity and how all evils come from the Rothschilds, and this is in areas that I should be feeling at home and comfortable, an alarm bell starts to ring because talking about the Rothschild's entity and Zionist conspiracies and Jewish banking control goes back to exactly what the Nazis said in the 20s and 30s. And we know what the end game of that is. I know what the end game of that is. You know, when I was four years old, my parents took me to the Holocaust Museum in, in Israel. I was far too young, but I, you know, I was watching and saw the end game of othering, the end game of Jew hate, the end game of racism, piles of bodies, children's shoes, hair. Um, you know, my, we spent a day with my father, looked up in the hall of names to see what had happened to, to our family. Um, you know, I, 
so many of us were watching um, a woman who spray painted the Warsaw ghetto wall with the words free Gaza being invited to the Labour Party conference to speak. And that was the moment where I flipped because my family didn't die in the Warsaw ghetto because of Israel. There was no Israel. There was no homeland and there was no Gaza. They were gas murdered, tortured, experimented on for being Jewish. And if your family's open grave had been spray painted and defaced, I would like to think that that person wouldn't be giving a, given a legitimate platform. And this idea that somehow Jews don't count um, because uh, we aren't seen, you know, we're white enough to pass, we're seen as Rothschild, economically secure, all these different things. I just couldn't keep silent anymore. And so I sat in the car and I put out a tweet that said, I'm very upset that this woman who spray painted my family's open grave has been invited and legitimized to come to, by momentum, to come to the Labour Party to talk. And um, the hatred that I got back from Labour Party members, from socialists, from some MPs, from some councillors was unbelievable. I sat in a car while a rolling screed of hate came my way. Every member of your family deserved to die to atone for one Palestinian's death. If all your family died in the Holocaust, why are you still here? The numbers don't add up. The hollow hoax is nonsense. Um, uh, prove us, prove to us that your family were in the Warsaw Ghetto. Um, the Warsaw Ghetto is nothing compared to Gaza. That was one I got, which was like, yeah, Gaza's hell, really hell, but it it is not the Warsaw Ghetto. Um, so, and the comparable is a false comparable. So I'm ranting at you now, Winston, but it touched a nerve and it, I looked around for grown-ups to come into this debate to say, this is Holocaust denial. Jeremy Corbyn has associated with people who are Holocaust deniers. He calls himself a man of peace and yet he invites terrorists from terrorist organizations for tea in parliament, but refuses and no platforms, all Israelis. You can't call yourself a man of peace if you're only prepared to talk to one side of an equation. Um, and I think that unfortunately, Jeremy's blind spot, Jeremy Corbyn's blind spot, when it came to what he saw as um, his work for Palestinian activism, often bled into anti Semitism and allowed anti Semitism to flourish. And that was the problem with left wing anti Semitism is that the left say, but we are the good guys, we are anti racist, therefore we can't be anti Semitic. Mm. And I think that is something that myself and David Baddiel and others have, have had to challenge to say we are of the left, but you are being anti-Semitic and it counts. Because you, you are a lifetime Labour Party member, is that correct? Or Well, my great grandparents in the East End were, you know, they, they were communists. They'd come over from, from Belarus where the pogroms were happening. You know, my great grandmother, who I've basically, I'm doing this Merchant of Venice later on um, next year, I base my Shylock on on her. This these tough, tough, tough Jewish woman that saw her was nearly raped when she was fourteen in Belarus. Nearly saw her father being beheaded. Um, Tsar Nicholas II was virulently anti-Jewish. He made all the Jews live in what was known as the Pale of Settlements, which was a, a sort of peasant living. A bit, you know, when you look at Anna Tefka and Fiddler on the Roof, that my great grandmother's grandmother always used to say that's a documentary because that was how they lived um, and she was sent out at 14 on a boat on her own to survive these pogroms and arrived in England met her future husband on the boat he was a staunch um, anti Zarist. they were for workers rights they were for the the, the universal uh, dignity and and rights for for all workers um, their Judaism in many ways was second to their politics and they came into the East End and they helped form the Labour Party. So the Labour Party, um, were, were, you know, I feel is in me and was part of me. And then to feel that I didn't have a place in that Labour Party because I was being told by Ken Livingston that basically all Jews are rich. Well, I know loads of non-Jews non -Jews who aren't rich. All Jews are, you know, part of a global Zionist conspiracy. What are you talking about? Hitler said that. And then when he went even further and said that, um, that the that Zionists had, I think he went on LBC. When I heard Ken Livingston say, Hitler was a Zionist until he went mad and murdered six million of them, which was offensive on so many levels. 
and Jeremy Corbyn's Labour Party were not really prepared to do anything about that. That was the moment that I knew I didn't really have a place in the Labour Party anymore. So where does that leave you politically? Uh... Look, as you yourself know, we are living in very divisive times. Mm -hmm. and, it's, and I think to speak out is brave because, as you and I both know, we could lose our livelihoods. We work in an industry that is cautious and tends to go with the flow of what is popularly seen as the correct way to talk <laughs> uh, because nobody wants to lose their jobs. And I think that that was the risk that I took in speaking out against, you know, saying, I don't think Jeremy Corbyn is everything that my industry is saying that he is. I don't think he's this kindly man. I think there's many facets here that, that worry me about him. And I have to say, uh, whilst it was brave, I ended up taking a lot of people with me. And after the election, and when more and more things came out about Jeremy and who he was and what he stood for and his position on Brexit and many, many things, as well as the anti-Semitism that seemingly flourished and the attacks that people like myself were getting online by his online hate army, uh, some of which seemed to come from organized groups within Momentum or Labour HQ. I don't know whether that's true, but um, it, 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 it became very difficult. I mean, the hate that I've received on the back of this is ridiculous. Myself and um, a television uh, presenter, Rachel Riley, uh, have had so much abuse over the years because we were two Jewish women who in the ad absence of anyone from the Labour Party or anyone else putting their heads and speaking out loud about it, we ended up becoming the sort of figureheads for that. And the misogyny and anti-Semitism that rolled into this hate was quite remarkable. You know, we've been called paedophiles, grooming paedophiles. I was told that, you know, I, I'm, I'm being paid by the Israeli government. I work for a foreign operative. Uh, the best one was, um, oh, that I'm a tax evading whore, a tax evading Rothschild whore. Uh, that I have a, this one was weird, that I have a castle in the Dodoin, never even been there, Winston, where I hide my tax evading Jew money. And that's why I didn't want to support Jeremy Corbyn. And this leads us on to the next thing, which is, I was always taught that when a minority tell you that they're feeling oppressed, hurt, got at, um, marginalized, abused, you listen to them. You don't try and interpret it. And what has happened more and more with Jewish people is right from the beginning when we went, oh, that is anti-Semitic. That is wrong. You can't really say that. We were told, oh, shut up. The reason that you're saying that is because A, B, C, and D. Yeah, they talk about anti-Semitism, but what they mean is A, B, C, and D. We, I myself and many others are constantly being told that what we really mean is and that's wrong. Yeah. And actually, there's a scene in, in, in uh, Ridley Road where you, your character and the black character uh, come together and say, aren't we fighting the same fight? Something along those lines, which I think... Chimes the Sara, but... Sara Soleimani, who adapted the book, that scene was very important to her. And I think it is important because it, it, she, my character, Nancy, who's a sort of female sort of de facto leader of, of, the, of the 62 group, the um, Stevie, the mixed race boy, comes in and says, I, I've just met your husband in prison and she says to him um we're we're fighting the same we, we've got the same fight and he says no it's not the same fight but you know maybe the feeling is the same something like that oh no that's right she says our experiences are the same and he says no our experiences aren't the same but we're fighting the same people and i want what i really wish at this time is that all it seems to me that so many minority groups are playing, um, are, are fighting each other, whereas really we should be pulling together. And when I think of the grand tradition of the black and Jewish community standing together um, against apartheid, civil rights in America, racism in this country, um, there is a long, long tradition of those communities being allies and friends and somewhere along the line that's been forgotten and I think we should remind ourselves that we are standing together rather than having to pull chunks of each other. Mm. Um, there's something that you said earlier, which I'm just not sure I've understood quite right, but I was asking about the film industry 
and what can and can't be said. And then we, we moved to uh, Corbyn's Labour Party. And it, w would it be, is there, speaking out against the Labour Party or against Corbyn, did that have repercussions within the film industry? Or was I thought, that... Yeah, I thought it would, um, because very much at that time, within my industry, there was a lot of support for Jeremy Corbyn, and people didn't want to be told or to be challenged on why there were lots of very worrying things and associations about him and the people that he surrounded himself by. And so I did take a risk, um, and I was very nervous that I would get cancelled because of it. But, you know, they, Winston, they say activists are born, not made. And sometimes you feel that your need to speak out for people who are frightened to do it was stronger than the need to protect my career. Um, so no, on the contrary, when I did start speaking out, I actually found the support that I was getting was unbelievable. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, casting directors, other actors, writers, writing to me going, I have wanted to say this for so long and I'm really scared to do it, but thank you for having the balls to do it. And then, and then slowly but surely more and more people started to check what the temperature was. And um, as more things were being reported and they were looking at it through uh, a different, a wider perspective rather than just an echo chamber, I think I took them with me and I've been humbled and amazed at how much support I have got, for, I've, had, I've had for it. And I think courage calls to courage everywhere. And I think that's what's, what happened with me. How, how, how was it for you? Um, I've certainly had a lot of uh, support um, and uh, a lot of private messages, but um, of, support, of support, which, is, which has given me much, um, much comfort. Um, and I do think that some of these, I do think it's the duty of people in, in positions of, of leadership or people like um, yourself who have, who have uh, achieve so much and, and are really leaders in, in the industry because it's the people who uh, who are much lower in the hierarchy so to speak or uh, you know, who, who have a lot more at uh, stake and, and, and if they lose the, their role or their job the, the, you know they lose it all and I think that the, those of us at the top should be the ones to be more vocal so I think there's a sense of I do see a sense of duty in that respect um, but what, uh, what, ha so what happened to you? What, 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 what was what was the situation? If you don't, I mean, you can cut yeah. this out, but remind me again, what, what actually happened that ended up with you? So I was through the pandemic tweeting about uh, books I was reading and tweeted uh, about a book critical of far left extremism in the US. So pretty niche for a Londoner. Um, and I really didn't have a big following at all. I think I only had a, a few thousand follow me and and this tweet blew up exploded and um ended being in a position where because i'm not a, a lone actor i'm not a, a I, I was with the band so they were getting all this abuse as a consequence of me of, of my my tweet um that i was in this position where i could i'd either have to lie to protect them so that they wouldn't have the abuse or tell the truth but remove myself so as so they didn't have to face the the abuse um which i think is ridiculous that uh, you know that a book can do that but nevertheless uh you know uh, i think one has to stick with one's one's beliefs and and it's been a very difficult period but as i said people have come out in in, in support and and uh, uh i do think that certain issues need a critical mass and and um, people can, you know, speak about it more. I think with, with watching you on anti-Semitism has been a really good example of that. I remember in summer 2020, I think, in the music industry, uh, it was uh, the, the, the Black Square BLM, everything, uh, BLM kind of taken, uh, it was captured the imagination of everyone. It was the number one issue. And I remember at the same time, uh, you had... People in the music industry, uh, I remember Ice Cube posting the Mere One mural that you referenced earlier. And then there was the Wiley rant, which I know you've spoken about. And actually, I know people that were uh, individually called out in that rant and were terrified for their lives, literally terrified for their lives. And all this was happening, and I, I found it very 
uh, confusing to be in a situation where racism was the number one issue, but this particular type of racism was not given even nearly the same kind of uh, attention. No, um, I led. I led uh, the kind of no safe space for Jew hate on uh, on Twitter. I, I, I weirdly, for whatever it did, um, I you know I was so horrified by the right Wiley thing, and I was so angry that this man had been allowed for two forty eight hours to tweet the most repulsive anti semitism, uh, just non stop, non stop to the point that. I ended up speaking to the CEO of Twitter and um, anyway, so uh, to say, you know, if you're monetized by hate and that's how you monetize your site, be honest about it. And they took, you know, so basically we did a two day walkout. We did a 48 hours of, of, of walking out with no safe space for Jew hate. We, you know, we came out with with a, with our logos and unbelievably we got we had a really, really good support for it. However wise it was, whatever it managed to achieve. But I tell you what it did manage to achieve. Again, it managed to achieve. It got all the way up to Parliament where uh, the Pretty Patel and Boris Johnson were talking about it. It, got, it was part of, I think, informing the online hate bill that's hopefully going through. It absolutely made it to every single news channel. Um, it got me talking to uh, the heads of Twitter who said, absolutely, we do not uh, monetize by hate. And they barred him. He then moved on to Instagram, where he then did four days of videos of nonstop Jew hate. Uh, and again, we did the 48 hour ban there, too. Um, and we we you know we my argument with those social media companies were particularly with instagram is if you can take a picture of a woman breastfeeding off your site because it's deemed offensive how have you let a man with effectively between twitter and instagram with a million followers give him a platform and a megaphone to scream out his jewish hate which was beyond belief um and if you do that for monetized clicks because it gets you followers and it gets people on your platform then you have to be open about it no 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 absolutely not and they oh. removed him he then moved on to facebook where he then did another four days of ranting about jews and then they removed him from that and i think because i'm i'm i started that because i was so angry for exactly that reason which is you can't be flagging up um you know, you, it's it's brilliant that BLM and, and Blackout Tuesday became a thing, but you can't let a man sit for six days spewing out how Jews are the root of all evil and the most money obsessed devils in the world. And Hitler had a reason for not liking them. That's that's crazy. So we got a lot of support for that. And it just takes people to turn around and go, this is unacceptable. Mm. No, Jews do count. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank goodness we have brave people like yourself doing that and and hopefully meaning that uh you know that th this kind of stuff well this stuff doesn't continue to happen although uh i'm pessimistic and i think that it will continue to happen but um uh at least it's being called out and and also you know what, one thing i would say winston and and this is the thing that i'm most pleased about is i was one of the few jewish people early doors that were prepared to stand up and go yes i am jewish i'm not going to hide it and i'm proud of my heritage and I'm calling out what is wrong. And as much hate as you throw at me, because I'm a woman, you think I'm going to disappear from these social media media sites because I want to be liked. And as an act actress, I want to be liked and be decorative. And I didn't. And many other women then wrote to me and went, wow, you know, watching you has made me feel brave enough to speak out to my boss at work, my boyfriend. You, I felt empowered. And I think we can't be what we can't see. So once we see people turning around and going, you know what, fuck it this is wrong, nobody else may be calling it out, but I'm prepared to do it. I think it gives, and, 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 I, and I'm still standing and still working more than ever. I think it does make other people braver. And I'm sorry that you had to, you felt you had to leave Mumford because I think that's wrong. People are allowed to have diverse opinions. Mm. Uh, it's interesting you say that with, 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 in the entertainment industry, you're right. It, it, one needs to be liked, that is, one sort of uh, trade, I, I, well, it's not that, you know, everyone, there's a lot of talent, you're a talented actress and, and you need to hone your craft, etc. But what you trade off is your likability. So you're putting yourself at tremendous risk at, uh, for your, for your uh, business uh, in, in taking that stance 
Um, and, but how great to hear that it hasn't actually had an impact. No, and I think it's better to be respected than liked. I think people Amen. respect. I think likability is, I don't even know what that even means. Why do we have to be liked? You just have to be true to yourself. I think when I think when people find when people are able to this sounds so wanky, but if you are your own best friend and your own cheerleader and you and you really stand by what your bottom lines and your truths are, able to change your opinion, able to hear other points of view, able to hear debate. But if you really stand for something, you can't be cancelled. Mm. And you take other people with you. And I hope one day you you know i hope you you do go back because i looked at you and thought how you know you're allowed to tweet out that you liked a book that other people disagreed with mm. you are allowed to do that and i couldn't understand the backlash but the anger and the fury that social media manages to whip up mm. and the power i do think the power of of social media is waning though and i think those online hate mobs that that pile on i think the power is waning and i think that has reached its critical mass i think the um the uh, you know as a very wise uh, rabbi Sachs once said anti-semitism is not about jews it's about a sickness in society and uh, a greater sickness and from it's what starts with the jews never ends with jews and i think if we allow jew hate to flourish in any society all other evils follow does does your to your point about um, uh, you know re respecting yourself and and, and um, uh, being at peace with yourself, how much? And this is a, perhaps a well, this is certainly a personal question, so you don't have to uh, go there. But does your Jewish faith uh, lead you in in that respect, or or, or does? Uh, I don't know if it's the faith. I know that there's something happened to me when I was four, and I went to the Holocaust Museum, and I remember looking around and feeling so overwhelmed by what this what what i was seeing that this was something about being jewish this was that all these people had put in so much work and effort to make this 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 death machine you know we have to my uncle who who survived uh, you know always said to me you know you've got to remember you had engineers coming in every day to mend those gas chambers you had um engineers coming in to mend the machines that used to frank the you know the, the, the germanic uh uh, the brilliant industrialization of that genocide was, you know, took people to manage it. So, you know, um, it just takes good people to look away for evil to flourish. And I think that was the main thing that I took was that, that if I, as, as much as the shame and that feeling of why do people hate Jews so much that they were prepared to build this, this death machine and why were they prepared to do all of these things over the, all these centuries? But if I've survived and I'm part of a, against all the odds of surviving, then I have a duty to stand up and call out all forms of bullying, racism and anti-Semitism. Yeah, absolutely. And I suppose social media is, is the, one of the ways to do that, I guess. So, and, and so you're going to keep getting abuse, right? If, you know, in continuing to use it, that abuse or yeah, it, I was I was put on 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 Twitter uh, when I was doing a film with um, Omid Jalili and uh, and and David Badil and and David Schneider, and they said, "Oh, you're going to love this site." So I was on it. I was quite an early adopter. Two thousand and nine. It was very it was very funny. It was very witty. You know, you'd be sitting there watching Bake Off with Stephen Fry and Mia Farrow. It was it was cute. It was you know it was it was fun. It was weird. You could it was kind of it was like being at a really funny witty party. And then, and I never received a single bit of abuse. A lot of friends, it was also very female. A lot of female journalists and, and actors I know did start to get trolled. I never got a single negative thing. But what I did begin to see was that it was being turned into a radicalization um, platform. And that when we now look at things like the Christchurch mosque massacre, uh, the two synagogues that got um, those massacres in, in America, and that gay bar in America, these people were radicalized online. And so Twitter became a platform that where people were living in echo chambers and were being radicalized by just hearing what they wanted to hear. And so I began to realize that if I stood up, I had to stand up to puncture other people's echo chambers and to challenge what people were hearing and using whatever platform I had in order to give a different point of view. And I do think that is why I stay on the hell site that is Twitter. And I think Instagram has become that way. I think those of us that have a voice, we need to stay on those platforms to show a different alternative. 
Long may it continue to use your voice because it's an important one. And yours too. Thank you. Um, so on a, a, a more positive note, uh, apart from Merchant of Venice, what does 2022 mean for you, Tracy Ann? Well, it, uh, it's interesting. I, I write a lot of Radio 4 plays, so I'm waiting to, I'm, I pitched a couple of Radio 4 plays that I hope I'm going to be writing. Um, I'm working with the Royal Court at the moment to um, do a piece of work on the back of the whole um, Herschel Fink uh, saga, another example of um, unconscious bias against Jews. Uh, what, what saga, sorry? The, uh, well, the Royal Court, which is this very progressive left-wing theatre, um, commit had a play that was going on with a character who um, they cast an actor who was known as The Nose. He was playing, um, whilst not being Jewish, he was playing a, um, a money-grabbing, um, money-orientated, slightly unscrupulous Elon Musk character, and his name was Herschel Fink. Um, so it was like every Jewish trope in the book, and that um, particular theatre had after um, B, you know BLM and and um, they went. They had a massive kind of uh, they 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 led within the theatre community a a, a very big um, workshop in working on prejudice, unconscious bias, and racism within their theatre. And uh, one of the things that was never mentioned was anti-Semitism. And the joke of it is that it led to this anti-Semitic trope, character, actor being on their stage. And everybody was asking how could that possibly have happened, given that it was flagged up three times in the early stages of the script, that you can't have a character called Herschel Fink, who's money grabbing, and uh, a businessman who is, um, is unscrupulous in his desire for money played by an actor called The Nose, you wouldn't have a character called Limpy Limpy wrist, Limp Wrist uh, Fairy, you know, all that stuff. Or So um, I, that's been, so I've been working with um, our, the artistic director, Vicky Featherstone, for actually quite a while, talking about uh, anti-Jewish sentiments on the left, and now we're talking about doing a project next year to, to start the dialogue on that. And hopefully if change happens within the Royal Court, it will filter down through equity and other Theatre Association. So that's interesting. Uh, waiting to hear whether a couple more TV things have been recommissioned, which I'm going to be doing, and also working on Our Merchant of Venice, which will be in February of, no, January 2023. So that will be a year's work and lots of things happening. Well, I'm very excited for those things and um, I very much intend to come to Merchant of Venice. And oh gosh, you're my, I, honestly, Winston, I love your music. I think you're you're a love, wonderful man, and it's really lovely to meet you. And I think it's great that you're doing this podcast. We have to be able to tolerate differences of opinion and diversity of voices. Otherwise, what is the point? What is the point? What is the point? We might as well live in a totalitarian regime. <laughs> nuance, nuance, nuance. Yeah, nuance. Well, it's a bit of a nuisance. Nuance it turns out. <laughs> um, uh, Tracy Ann Oberman, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you. And, um, well, uh, yeah, it's been wonderful hearing from you. Thank you.